Okay, we're back here live at EMC World. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. And uh, we're here at EMC World in Las Vegas, our fourth year consecutive with theCUBE. theCUBE was born in 2010 here at EMC World. And one of the great things about uh, theCUBE is we get to go to the events, and extract the signal from the noise, and talk to the executives of the companies at the event here. It's EMC, so we talk to all the head, head honchos. But more importantly, we love to go out into the crowd and find out the emerging players, the ones that aren't the big whales, the ones that are that are gaining ground, and uh, we have a great guest here, uh, the chairman and CEO of Service Mesh, Eric Fleer. Um, thanks for coming on theCUBE. It's great to be here, thanks. So Service Mesh is in the hybrid cloud management uh, for applications, yeah. um, which is the cutting edge area right now because cloud mobile and social has become the buzzword, the yeah. pillars that everyone's building and transforming their infrastructure to to literally go to as what I call a modern infrastructure. That's right. And it's a huge inflection point. I once called it the combination of client, server, computing, and the PC revolution boiled together, and that's kind of the action we're seeing in terms of dynamics and impact. Yeah. And it's happening very, very fast. So, so I want to ask you, um, you guys have an uncontested lead in this area, but you're, you're not a huge company. I mean, you got all right. these big companies that could be doing it. Why are you guys gaining so much traction? Yes. Well, we're not a huge company compared to the ones that I'm sure you're thinking of, the IBMs, the MCs of the world. But we are, we are growing. And I think we're growing primarily uh, because that we've taken an approach that's very customer-centric. So in other words, when this IT transformation, as you put it, started to become ubiquitous, the CIOs of the world started to look for a problem, uh, to solve a problem that was really focused on uh, applications, getting them to market faster, uh, and having a lower cost base to run them. Uh, so there was a lot of pressure on them that really had a lot to do with business metrics. And yet the field that had really come up through virtualization and infrastructure automation uh, had a natural affinity to approach the same set of problems from their place of knowledge, which is infrastructure, right? So you start with infrastructure optimization and you start to move up the stack. The problem is that this is really not ultimately an infrastructure problem. It's an infrastructure in, in search of an application. In other words, what good is infrastructure if it's not um, helping applications. So we really approached it from the app down and I think yeah. that's changed our model. Yeah, Sean Douglas, a recent hire of yours, actually is from EMC, I've gotten yeah. to know Sean, he was at EMC Ventures. You guys really had an, a stellar hire with Sean. He's now yeah. CTO of your company and your co-founder, uh, Frank, is now in charge of strategy. Kind of looking at the next, next mountain to climb for service mesh, which yeah. it, it, the market's growing like crazy. So I, gotta, I gotta ask you, I mean, you know, we saw DevOps really change the game around you know, web scale companies saying, hey, I want to be more hyperscale. Yeah. So you know, DevOps became a very popular kind of pre-cloud yeah. you know, developer community. That has now blown up huge into cloud operations, right? Yeah. So cloud operations is the public cloud. We know Amazon, OpenStack, we had you on at OpenStack, but more importantly, the enterprises aren't necessarily that eager to go to the, the public cloud for a lot of variety of reasons, compliance, security, above data, et cetera, et cetera. They're going there. It's a destination for them. Absolutely. So the hybrid cloud is a nice fit for you guys. Yeah. So I got to ask you about the competitive landscape. What do you see out there for companies that are taking the best of DevOps, what was proven as, hey, I can develop on, and on cloud resources, yeah. launch new apps, right. and actually mm -hmm. make this stuff run fast and deliver business value. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's a mainstream requirement right now. Hard yes, to get it to. It is. So what is the competitive landscape? Okay, well I think you've hit it on the head in terms of what the requirement is. It's how do you actually create a, a, an automated DevOps tool chain, which is how do you get a concept to production faster? And how do you do that with some of the existing tool sets that you have? Because in an enterprise, they're not going to throw it out everything and just buy your newfangled toy, right? So what we see in the marketplace are people attacking this from different angles. You have the guys, as we discussed just earlier, that are looking at it from infrastructure optimization or automation. So they take these kind of old-fashioned runbook automation tools and they try to apply it up the stack. Then you've got guys who are really focused on DevOps who have like uh, an ability to do what they might call continuous delivery or some kind of uh, automated way of, of bringing you along a release management chain, but they're not well connected to the infrastructure. 
And at the core of all this is really a policy problem, right? From, a, from an enterprise point of view, you want your constituents, your, your uh, business units, to go fast, but they have to stay safe. If you turn over the reins for IT as a service to the business, and you don't have an effective policy or governance model, then everything falls apart. So what we've done at Service Mesh is we've really started there. What if we could build an extensible, incredibly powerful policy core and apply that up to the DevOps tool chain and down into the infrastructure so that you can uh, essentially provision real-time applications or application platforms and then treat code as a first-class citizen and move it along a software delivery lifecycle. So this, this entire landscape of problems that one has to solve, if you don't have a policy core that has some fidelity across these different problems, then essentially you end up with point solutions and they become more trouble than their work. Yeah, I mean, we love that. I love the infrastructure as code um, concept because that's about making things programmable. Yeah. And you know, the buzz here is software-defined storage. And obviously software-defined networking kicked off the software-defined everything, or as we say, software-led infrastructure. Um, but let's take a step back. I want to ask you one question around the operating system of the data center and how the data center is changing you know, to, a, from a, to a, like more of an API model, like a like Amazon. Yeah. But <laughs> how did you guys get started? Talk about Service Mesh, because okay. you guys aren't a big well-known company right. other than in, the, in, the, in the vertical people know you, you're doing extremely well. How did you guys get here? Okay. Um, tell us, you know, yes. how, did, how did you guys start the company? You have a co-founder, met yeah, Frank yeah. at OpenStack. Sure, sure. You guys have teamed up on other deals. Yes. Um, so tell us the story. Sure. Well, Service Mesh is a company that's a long time in coming. So it seems like maybe we've done about half a decade of work um, and done a lot in half a decade. You know, five years of hard work building a, an application that we think could be fundamentally important to this space. But the truth is we spent a lot of time prior to that, uh, which is really the story of Service Mesh. So the, the folks that have built Service Mesh have decades of experience in the enterprise. So we didn't approach this from um, a, a consumer perspective or even an, an infrastructure perspective. We, uh, we approached it from an application-centric mentality uh, from other ventures that we had done in uh, the enterprise. So for instance, a previous venture that Frank and I had worked on together was called SOA Software. We spent quite a bit of time really focused on what does it take to As have- As in service-oriented architecture. Service-oriented architecture. What does it take to scale service-oriented architecture from a governance and policy point of view? Well, that's a stepping stone to the same type of problems that we needed to solve here. So the way that this came about is that we've built, um, I think, a certain amount of credibility and relationships in the enterprise space, and we were able to call from those relationships the set of requirements that were converging on a similarity. The bet was, that by the time we were able to build something that was <coughs> scalable and referenceable, that the market would arrive. So rather than take uh, a normal approach, which would be uh, early VC money, a lot of PR, a lot of marketing, everyone knows about you, and then you do a lot of pilots, but the market's not there, we went the opposite approach. We went really deep with select, highly complex, regulated, multinational organizations to really prove out that we had and something. And you self-funded. We self-funded. And when we got to the point where the market started to arrive and we had referenceability where companies could stand up and say, we've saved $150 million. We've fundamentally transformed our productivity metrics. And we, and we were able to point to those companies and they would stand up proudly and, and speak to the same. Then we felt we were ready to scale. And so that brought us maybe to about 18 months ago where we took on our first capital. Uh, from Ignition, which has been fantastic. Frank for us. Artali. And Frank Artali and John Great Connors guy. and the Cube rest. alumni. Oh, uh, yeah, amazing. Frank's the Cube alumni. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, he's been <laughs> on multiple times. We love Frank, he's a friend of ours. He, he's great. And so we, we, we couldn't be happier with our partnership there. And they've really supported this company, backed it, and uh, made it what it is today um, in the sense that we took that backing and then built out the structures for scale. And that's where we are now. So basically, if I can summarize, you made a big bet. You made a big bet that web yeah. services and service oriented architecture, AKA now APIs, yeah. would, be, would be big. Yes. Now, if you look back a decade ago, and even more than a decade ago, that was web services. And, and that's now hit it. Yes. I mean, so that kind of went through this like, well, yeah, it wasn't really ready for prime time, yeah. the web services, but it's changed too with cloud. So, so you're in a good spot. So you essentially so. skated to where the puck, you went where the puck was coming. You, didn't, you were already there waiting well, for that's it. that's right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so take us now today. So you, you made a good bet. Both have the chops to do that. You got the multi now clients, now you're growing, you got the funding. How does this world that you're living in now change? Because you know, we had a, the, the CIO of EMC on earlier, uh, as consistent with other thought leaders, mm -hmm. validated again, 
that the operating system model of the of the data center really is what people should be thinking about. Yes. That the data center is now an operating system. And operating Would systems have that. subsystems, layers of software. Yeah. So things like configuration, ability, management, automation, all become part of that fabric. Yes. So you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay, so, that, so that's cool. So we don't need to spend that. What's the, so with that, what is the mandate? I'm a CIO. Yeah. Okay, I say, okay, the future is obvious now. The fog has lifted. I got to get to a cloud-like environment have utilities and APIs, but still keep my on-premise. Yes. What is the mandate for the CAO to move there, and what do they do, and how do you guys help them? Well, it's, it's a very good question, because that actually is the question that we most often have to ask ourselves, because ultimately you want CIO buy-in. This is a really a moment in time that is, I don't think that we've seen since the late 90s. It's truly IT transformation, nobody's business as usual. So the CIO has a set of, um, common concerns right now of an enterprise. One is that the CFO has come to them and said you have to cut out anywhere from 150 million to a billion dollars of your annual spend. So you have to cut the run rate down to the extent that you can't just shave around the edges. There's an operating model shift that's necessary. The other thing is that the business now needs to compete with a different set of constituents. The business is no longer satisfied with the monopoly internally to uh, supply them with what's necessary in order to do their job. So what happens is when the business gets a mandate from the CEO and the chief marketing officer, et cetera, to get into new markets, new emerging markets with new products faster, to compete with upstarts who don't have the same difficult quagmire of regulatory issues, et cetera, then what happens is if the IT organization can't respond fast enough and can't be a better partner, they go around them. And this phenomenon is known as shadow IT because the business units say, okay, in the past, we would just be sluggish along with you, but now they're saying, we'll go to Amazon, we'll go to Salesforce, we'll go to Rackspace, we'll go around you and put in our credit card and we'll start doing our work because we have to get something done. But they're cobbling together, right? So what happens is that goes outside the operating system model. Exactly. They're going, the shadow IT is, you know, as we said, it's innovation opportunity. Yes. I mean, so yeah, it's rogue, but rogue sometimes is R&D. And, and innovation. You justify it because it's more convenient, you have yeah. to get your job done. However, that brings us to where we are today. What the CIO wants is not that. CIO doesn't encourage shadow yeah, IT, yeah. it's a regulated environment. Yeah, don't you ask, can, don't tell policy. This, no, this, it has to be managed, it's governed. It, you, have, you have auditors, right? Yeah. Legal. So what the CIO wants is to be able to offer the same level of convenience and agility that they can get externally, internally. Essentially, it's this. The CIO wants to transform the IT organization to become a cloud broker that can deliver IT as a service directly to the business. That's what every CIO is looking to do. And the way that you do that. And you got to cut the middleman yes. out. Well, you become the middleman, okay. right? And as the middleman, you now have an ecosystem of service providers. And this, is, and this is very interesting, because now you say, okay, well what does the CIO think about? Well, he thinks about pleasing the CEO and, and the COO and the, and the CFO. Do, do they care about software-defined networking, software-defined storage? Only in so far as it supports applications, and right, because applications are where you make your money and it's where you spend your money. So at, what we like to show at Service Mesh is that we can be that connective tissue, that glue, we got, but, but behind that software-defined data center vision, and the practical application of that to what the enterprise actually needs to fulfill their IT transformation goals. So let's talk about um, the large companies out there, because you mentioned them earlier, that people might build a point solution and then it kind of breaks. Um, and all you, you also mentioned a comment that early on you, made, you saved the company $150 million. Yeah. Um, give an example of a use case, you don't have to name names, but sure. where you've walked in and literally saved a company over $100 million. Okay, so I'll give two, if I might. Is that accurate, you've done that? Yes, uh, not me personally, but our team. Yeah, service man, <laughs> yeah, you as the me. I wish I, could, uh, <laughs> I wish I could do half of the things You're that the our Superman company does. Hero, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they don't let me touch anything these days. But um, uh, what we've done at Service Mesh is actually just that. We've been able to come into organizations that are looking to affect that model, to become an IT broker and give them the tools where they can do that, but still have the same manageability and auditability and security that they have now. So they can feel that comfort to shift to this model. So what we've done at one particular bank is we put in that model and we did a few things. The first was to look at existing applications and understand how you can migrate them onto uh, more standardized platforms, right? Because a lot of the cost structures in the enterprise today 
come from all these insane Rube Goldberg machines that these applications live on top of. As you shift to a cloud model, you're also shifting to a model of more standardization, less variability, so you can have less people to run them, right? So that's where a lot of the cost comes, is you can lower your FTE count around that particular function. So that's one thing. The next thing is, how do you actually create those standardized platforms so that they can be automated from beginning to end? And what we mean by beginning to end is really no human intervention. <clears throat> the only place you want human intervention is where you want to go back later and maybe insert some for some reason that you say, okay, we want Joe to approve this or Sally to approve that, but you don't want to be forced to any human intervention, which means you have to replace every um, sticky point where there's a human today with a policy. So the central policy engine from ServiceNet, Service Mesh allows you to, uh, in essence, create those policies, but manage them centrally, change them centrally, version them centrally, in essence, scale. So you end up with this capability of having an end-to-end -end provisioning, okay? Once you do that, you now can provision complex topologies, which are known as application platforms, and put them in an app store. And, and that's an example of something that we've brought forward, that by reducing the manual steps and the number of people necessary, and increasing the standardization, we've been able to save the company significant um, capital in the yeah. range of what you uh, Economics is a great proof point, too, in terms yes. of that valu valuation. Especially if they're willing to stand up and verify those economics. Yeah, yes. not, not, a lot of people, not a lot of people can say, have people stand up and saying, we've saved <laughs> over $100 million. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you about, speaking of like large, complex deployments, I mean, let's talk about VCE. We're, you know, we're going to have them on the cube here. Yeah. Um, so VCE is a flagship offering for, you know, around EMC, you know, sure. VMware, you know, everyone knows this was involved. Um, big problem, a lot of referenceability, same kind of challenges. Um, how do you guys play with VCE and how do you complement, say, VC? Because that's an environment that is yeah. not easy to turn key. So, well, or is it? We think it is easy to turn key. If just because it hasn't necessarily been uh, turned key to the extent that, that, it, that it will soon, it uh, doesn't mean that, that it's not getting there. In Do fact, you guys work with VCE at all? Yes, and we think it's a fantastic product. Um, the V-Block is, um, it's on fire. I mean, uh, it's, it's a staple of the enterprise, uh, or it's becoming that way, right? So we actually believe uh, very strongly in that vision of converged infrastructure and the units of provision being um, a, uh, a, a unit that you don't have to assemble various pieces and parts, right? So from the end user experience, what you really want is the ability to put a cloud in the box in the data center and um, instantly begin getting uh, business value. And what you're describing is that there's still some friction between that, um, uh, event, that, that arrival of a V-Block on site to when somebody can get business value. We think that we can add a lot of value to in that. In what, the automation side, management in general? Or? Uh, uh, two things, one is um, obviously on the automation side, which is core to what we do, but even more importantly, to bridge that gap from a policy and governance directly into the software delivery lifecycle. Because why does someone want a V-Block? One is complexity reduction, right? You could assemble it yourself otherwise. And the other is business value. So the complexity reduction piece we can add because you can install service mesh in a matter of hours as opposed to weeks you know, that a lot of uh, competing capabilities uh, cause. Uh, the, the next thing is, well, now that you've got it in in hours, what are you going to do with it? The, the, the idea is that you want to deliver IT as a service which is the ability to spin up application platforms, not VMs, but true platforms that you can start writing code on and deliver that directly to the end user. Now you can't do that without the right policies. You can't do that without a notion of application lifecycle because what are they doing? They're building applications in a lifecycle. We've spent five years doing that and I think that's our value that we can bring okay. to VCE. We're getting the hook here so I'll give you the final word, talk to the camera and tell them yeah. what's next for Service Mesh, what's your year look like, what's your goals? So our goal now is, uh, it's a very exciting year for us. So our goal really is scale. Uh, we put the uh, structures in for scale. We're beefing up on the support side. Our, our channel partnerships are becoming increasingly important. I think what you'll hear from us is a number of SIs and service providers, MSPs, and uh, even ISVs that will be OEMing and reselling our products. So we're excited. We think this is the year where we'll, we will become better known. <laughs> <laughs> Service mesh, up and coming, hot startup, Thank scaling, you. and not startup anymore. They're growing like crazy. Self-funded, great entrepreneurial story. Congratulations, Eric Boulier, uh, chairman and co-founder and CEO of Service Mesh, a company to watch here at EMC World. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>